it's Alana at Harbor House Seafood in Hatteras, and I'm out fishing for mahi on the hard way. This is my friend Isaac, he's the first mate, and we're gonna show you how we pelagic longline for mahi-mahi in the US. Longline just means that we're using a 15 mile main line and we're clipping smaller lines to it. So day three is finally calm. A little bit, it's flown five miles an hour, so there's a little bit of a wave, but. I can definitely handle it. The first two days were hard. Twenty miles an hour. I didn't like it. I didn't go home. And I had opportunity to go home. And I didn't take it. Okay, so here's that little bit of a wave I was talking about. This is five mile an hour wind, so not bad. Look at this water, see how it glitters? Oh my God, it's so beautiful. All right, so now we're going here. Isaac has some bait here. This is squid, and he's going to take it to the back of the boat where he is putting it on some hooks. We call leaders, and this is the gear that he was making yesterday on the way out. So each one of these has a six foot long piece of fishing line. It's got a circle hook and a snap. So he puts a piece of bait on it and then he snaps it to that main line, which is 15 miles long, which we call the long line. And it goes out and it's gonna be detached from the boat and drifting in the water. So then next to us, we have Dave there and he's gonna clip on this buoy which we call Dob and then that keeps it floating so now he's getting told to hurry up by Isaac and he's gonna put the GPS buoy on there and this GPS buoy has a locator that transmits to a machine that we have in the cabin and this is how we tell where our gear is because it's detached from the vessel and it's drifting and it could drift 30 miles, so you need to keep an eye on it because it's twenty to $30,000 worth of fishing gear. So this is not a security camera from the captain. This is from National Marine Fishery Service. This is one of the many oversight measures we have. Another oversight is our hooks. So you can see our hooks there. Those are called circle hooks. We are told to use those. You can see J hooks on the left and circle hooks on the right. Researchers determined that hook modifications are the primary means of reducing sea turtle capture. So circle hooks are generally considered to be turtle friendly. They result in a lower capture rate and fewer deep hookings compared to J hooks. And what we mean with deep hookings is the turtle or the fish will swallow the J hook and then it pokes out into their throat and they immediately die usually upon release. The circle hook, you can see how that barb is pushed in and the hook itself is curved. So that results in the fish being captured at its cheek. So if it is a fish we're not keeping, such as a shark, undersized, oversized, wrong species, we cut the line, the hook will rust out very quickly and the fish is not affected. So while we are not responsible for the decimation of turtles globally, nor in the United States, we still have to take measures to protect them. So these are our endangered species. They are protected under the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Act. And here you can see the regions of the United States where we go fishing. So we are in SAB, Region 4. We also overlap into Region 5. You can see here how many turtles are captured. So if you look off the coast of North Carolina, we have very, very minimal turtle interactions. The majority are happening in the Northeast, which is what actually caused our fishery to be closed for a couple years in the early 2000s. So to take measures, we have video cameras on board and we also have observers who go with us on 10% of our trips. They keep track of the turtles themselves and then we also do log books after every trip and we report to NOAA what we have caught. 
If you have any interactions with mammals, they must be reported. So here is logbook data from 1993, which shows you how long we've been doing it. I feel like it's fair to say 28 years ago, we had a lot more turtles and a lot more fish. So we captured 248 turtles during the entire year 1993 in the pelagic longline industry in the United States of America. Our foreign competitors do not have fishery management and observer programs like we do in the States. So I have data from the Marine Turtle Research Group here. From 2000 to 2007, they used shore-based and onboard observer programs from three ports in Peru to assess the impact on marine turtles of small-scale longliners. They reported 5,900 turtles are captured annually. This includes 3,200 loggerheads, 2,400 green turtles, 240 olive ridleys, and 70 leatherback turtles. The small-scale fisheries in Peru are widespread and numerous. There's more than 100 ports, 10,000 vessels, and more than 37,000 fishermen. They suggest the number of turtles captured per year is likely to be in the tens of thousands. Thus, the impacts of Peruvian small-scale fishing have the potential to severely impact sea turtles and other marine life, including seabirds and sensitive species of sharks. Why are so many sea turtles dying in Peru's longline fishery? Because... They won't change the kind of hooks they're using. They still use J-hooks, and circle hooks are considered to be turtle-friendly. Hook modifications are the primary means of reducing sea turtle capture, and until Peru makes an effort to switch away from J-hooks, their turtle bycatch numbers are going to remain high and probably get higher. A circle hook is like getting cut on your arm. A J-hook is like getting stabbed in the gut. You're going to bleed out and it's going to be painful and violent. We prefer circle hooks. They produce higher quality fish in a friendlier manner. So you can see on this Mako shark, there's two circle hooks in his cheek. We're not allowed to keep these. If we catch them live, we have to cut the line off. So that's where those two came from. He got caught up on his tail, resulting in his drowning. That's why we could keep him. He was dead. Isaac is back here baiting and that camera watches him the entire time to make sure we're compliant and it is fed to this monitor and you can see down here in the corner it's recording it has our GPS location and it's got a camera pointed on the baiting and it also has a camera on the right side here where we retrieve our gear. This is called the vessel monitoring system and all pelagic longliners in the United States are required to have this. The footage is sent into National Marine Fisheries Service after the trip and two hours out of every 10 hours is reviewed unless you catch something a hot triggered word such as sea turtle or shark or something you're not supposed to have bluefin you're allowed to have bluefins they will watch all 10 hours this is our logbook program so we can set every time we put a hook in the water we have to plug it in here and tell noah we are on the deck now and wimpy is starting to retrieve the gear we call this haul back so he's tying the main line onto his spool and he's going to begin retrieving the gear. So we set the gear out. It takes about an hour and a half. We leave it to soak for a few hours and then we drive back to the top of the line which takes about an hour and a half to two hours. Here you can see the line spinning on the spool and it just comes through that pulley and then onto the spool. And here he is unclipping one of the leaders, which is the fishing line that we use to catch the fish. And Isaac's gonna hang it back up. These are all the baits that we set out earlier and now we're retrieving them. So you just go through, drive your boat down the long line for 15 miles and just unclip the baits that you clipped on and hope that a decent amount of them have fish and they're not tangled up like that.
Some of them will have to be cut off because they were tangled so much or a fish pulled on them a lot and burned out the fishing line. So, and you can see how much skill it takes to drive the boat. Wimpy is having to go in and out of gear. You can see how non-invasive this fishing practice is. Here is the mahi hooked up and he's just reeling in the line until the fish gets close enough to the boat. Isaac is gonna go down with the gaff as Wimpy leaders in the fish and he's gonna gaff it and bring it onto the boat. You see where Isaac gaffed that mahi right in the head? That is something that charter boat mates need to learn. All mates need to learn. Always gaff a fish in the head. Here is Dave gutting a mahi. That's a nice one there. We call that a gaffer. There's gaffers and there's heavers. Gaffers you need a gaff to pull it up and heavers you can just heave it over with your arm. So all you do here is you slice the belly open and you pull out what's inside. But if you don't do it, your fish isn't going to be any good. So make sure you do it. Bycatch is a major issue with pelagic longline fisheries. I'm not trying to hide that, but I am trying to shed light on the measures that United States fishery managers and fishermen are taking to keep our impact on the environment at a minimal. And I want to shed light on how foreign countries are not doing the same and yet their fish can be sold in the same marketplace and undercut the price and the value of the fish that we're bringing to dock because we care about the turtles and the birds and the sharks we don't want to catch them whereas in foreign countries like Ecuador and Costa Rica and Peru they have minimal measures in place to protect seabirds and sharks and sea turtles. And because your fish is cheaper, doesn't mean its impact to the environment is cheap. It's not. It's hard hitting and it's devastating.